tonight and to be able to share this time of Bible study with you. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2. That will be our text for the evening as we discuss the subject, Why is your face so sad? It is good to be here uh, at Midway. I have a lot of fond memories of this good church uh, going back, uh, well, three decades or so. Uh, I can remember when Richard Rogers preached here and uh, coming over to gospel meetings at this good church and uh, listening to uh, many uh, faithful gospel preachers. And then through the years, having had the opportunity to be here on a couple of other occasions to speak to you uh, on your Wednesday night series. And uh, of course, uh, it's always good to see Mark and Marlene, although Mark is out of town. He informed me of that uh, this morning, and I hate to miss him. Uh, but uh, have fond memories of Mark and Marlene as uh, we were in school together at Faulkner, or Mark and I were, and uh, Marlene and my wife tried to keep us straight and make us behave, and that's a challenge within itself. But uh, they are two dear friends, and I know that you're grateful for their presence here, and I am as well, and I know they're doing a great work, and uh, I thank God for them. Uh, I sometimes wonder when I receive uh, the topics that are assigned uh, for the series, why did I get this topic? I was telling the brother out in the foyer that uh, uh, we have a gentleman at Decatur Highway that leads singing for us sometimes, and uh, he grew up in the church, does a fine job leading singing. Uh, but we were having a singing workshop on one occasion, and uh, the man that was conducting the workshop asked him to get up and lead a song, and he said, okay, that was fine, you pitched it well, and you did a good job, and everybody followed along, but let's sing another verse, and this time smile. And so he led the next verse, and uh, uh, his face didn't change. So he said, well, now lead another verse, and this time smile real big. And uh, he led another verse, and his face didn't change. And uh, he was a little bit confused himself. He finally said, am I not smiling? I feel like I'm grinning from ear to ear. And, uh, but uh, somehow uh, his mind was not connecting with his face to tell his his, uh, the corners of his mouth to turn up or whatever. So uh, sometimes we think we're giving some facial expressions uh, that maybe we're not, or maybe we give confusing facial expressions. Body language is an interesting thing. We all give it whether we realize it or not. Body language can tell us a lot about what someone is thinking, about what someone is feeling, uh, and about uh, various other things that they may be going through at that time. If you're a parent, you've experienced body language. You ask your child, who did this? And you start to see one of your children fidget a little bit and look down at the ground and, and uh, be evasive and, and they don't want to answer the question straight. Well, body language is telling you who did it, isn't it? And uh, so we learn to read body language from many different people. If somebody comes toward you and they got a big smile on their face, they seem to almost be jumping out of their skin. Well, you know something good has happened. You may not know what it is, and you may wait for them to tell you, but you know something good has happened to them. That's body language, and we all read body language. Now, the countenance or the face is something that we take a look at and that is the easiest to read. As a matter of fact, uh, I looked up some facts about smiling. Now, I know our text is about being sad, but let's think about smiling for a moment. Uh, we're told by those that have studied such things that smiling can boost your mood. It can do so more so uh, than chocolate. Now, I love chocolate, so I have a hard time really believing that. But uh, nonetheless, uh, they say that smiling can boost your mood more than chocolate. It can even boost your mood more than some medications that are prescribed for uh, mood boosting and so forth. And so it is important for us to learn how to smile. Even a forced smile sometimes can make a complete difference in someone's disposition. They tell us that it takes somewhere between 5 and 53 muscles to smile. Now, you've probably heard the old adage that it takes uh, more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, and I don't know where that came from and uh, where, how that was purported upon us, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's not uh, true that it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile, so it's easier to smile. But smiling will do a lot more for you than frowning will, and it will do a great deal to changing your disposition and your outlook. 
A smile is easily recognizable. As a matter of fact, it's the most recognizable uh, element of body language that any of us can convey. A smile can be recognized uh, from as far away as 300 feet. You can see somebody uh, a football field away, and if they're smiling, you can tell it, and you recognize it almost immediately. I'll tell you something else you may not realize, but a smile can be recognized even when it's not seen. Did you realize that? My first uh, paying job when I was a teenager outside of working for my dad, my dad was a contractor, and so when he needed good free labor, <clears throat> I was the oldest boy and I was it. Uh, but uh, uh, he, would, he would feed me well, so I don't guess it was entirely free. But uh, my first paying job outside of working for my dad was for a little radio station in my hometown. And I remember when I first started working there and started uh, doing some things on air, uh, that the, uh, the program manager who was training me, he said, now always remember when the microphone is on, smile. I thought, that's an odd thing. I said, why do I need to smile? Nobody's going to see me. They're only going to hear me. He said, believe it or not, people can hear you smile. Your voice changes when you smile. You sound better when you smile. And so he encouraged all the people that worked for him to smile. And I found through the years that it is indeed true. And uh, so uh, even though you may be talking on the phone to somebody, if you've got a grimace on your face, guess what? It's going to come across in your voice. But if you'll smile, you could even say some things they might not uh, enjoy hearing. But if you smile about it, it'll come across a little bit better. And so always remember to smile. And smiling is contagious. You ever sat and looked at somebody and they just sit there with a grin on their face? And next thing you know, you know, the corners of your mouth are turning up. You ever looked at a baby and you just smile at them? And, uh, and before you know it, they're, they're trying to copycat. And they want to smile too. A smile's contagious. And so smiling can be very important. Our countenance can be very important. And that is what our text points to. In Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we read that in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. This is Nehemiah speaking. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. We'll talk about that last phrase here in just a moment. But let's set the scene a little bit. Four months earlier, a group of people had journeyed from uh, Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah was part of the captivity. Artaxerxes was a king of the Persians, and uh, he was serving in Artaxerxes' court. The last verse of chapter 1 alerts us to the fact that uh, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. So he would bring whatever wine or drink that the king uh, desired to enjoy into the throne room or into the, uh, the festival room, the, the eating room, uh, and uh, he would bring that to the king and present it to the king. That was his job. But some four months earlier, a group of people uh, that uh, had among them Nehemiah's brother came from Jerusalem uh, to uh, where Nehemiah was living. And uh, his brother informed him uh, that the city of Jerusalem was still lying in ruins, that the people there were in danger, and uh, that they were even being shamed by the people that surrounded them. They were being mocked. They were being ridiculed. And so they were living in a state of great trouble. Verse one, uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 uh, says, according to the ESV, and of shame. Now this news hit Nehemiah quite hard. Because he loved Jerusalem. I don't know how you are about your hometown. Maybe you don't love your hometown as much as other people do. Uh, so I've heard people say, well, uh, I'm from such and such city. And that's probably the best thing I can say. I'm from there. I don't still live there. Um, but uh, some people love their hometown. Maybe that's you. And if something bad happens in your hometown, your heart breaks, doesn't it? You, you feel uh, terrible about those circumstances that may take place. Now, you may live many miles away. Some of you may have grown up right here, and you've lived here your entire life. Maybe you live as close by as Jasper or Oakman or some of the other nearby towns. 
I'm from the state of Florida. I'm a long ways from home. But, uh, you know, when those hurricanes come up the coast, I pay attention. And uh, when I see the destruction that sometimes happens along the coast, and uh, I know those areas. I know people who live in those areas. It breaks my heart. It troubles me because I don't like to see that. Well, that's sort of where Nehemiah was. And uh, since the city was destroyed, when Babylon came in, swept in and overtook the city and carried the people away, it still was lying in ruins, though it was many, many years later. And the people were in danger and ashamed as a result. The text says in verse 4 of chapter 1, Nehemiah took this so hard that he wept for days. He just laid right down and bawled. He mourned over the city, and he was troubled greatly uh, because of its condition. And over the a period of, of four months, the next four months, Nehemiah spent time praying and planning and thinking, what can I do, what can, uh, what can I possibly affect over there when I am over here, how can I help the people? And, uh, and so that was uh, the course of his life on a day-to-day -day basis over the next four months. Now, uh, apparently he did all of this in private because chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us that he had not been sad in the presence of the king. So in private he would weep, in private he would mourn, in private he would pray, in private he would lament the condition of the city of Jerusalem. But in front of the king he put a smile on and he just went about his way. He did his job. He did as well as he could. And as I said, verse 11 of chapter 1 identifies the fact that Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. So it was on one occasion that he was called upon to bring uh, wine into the king. Now, cupbearer's job in oriental uh, nations and countries and societies was very important. One, he had to taste what he was giving to the king first, make sure nobody had poisoned it, and so he was putting his life on the line every time that he did his job. Number two, he was bringing drink to the king, so it was intended to make him merry, and if you're wanting to make somebody merry, uh, then you need to have a smile on your face. You're not going to come in with a morose look and uh, sadness and make anybody happy. And so Nehemiah had a responsibility then, uh, not just to deliver the wine, but to be happy about what he was doing and to present him that, uh, that way, himself that way in the presence of the king. Now, some oriental countries and scholars suggest to us uh, that Persia was of this nature as well because of its hard line about uh, royalty and about uh, the law. Uh, but some oriental countries also, uh, if, uh, if you came into the presence of the king with bad news without being told to come in, or if you came into the presence of the king with a sad face, as Nehemiah does here, then the king immediately could, uh, could banish you from his sight and put you to death. And so it could be a crime punishable by death. The book of Nehemiah never suggests that that was the case except for that phrase at the end of verse 2, Nehemiah was afraid. He knew it was not good that the king had recognized what he had been enduring all of this time. Now, somebody said maybe this was Nehemiah's Blue Monday. I don't know what exactly struck Nehemiah at this particular point. For him to endure this for four months, praying and planning and weeping and, and mourning over the condition of his hometown, uh, and, and yet never showing these emotions to the king. But on this day, when he walked in, the king knew immediately that something was wrong. But instead of throwing him out of the throne room, instead of banishing him to death, uh, something unexpected happened. Artaxerxes showed concern for Nehemiah. Artaxerxes showed compassion toward Nehemiah, and he wanted to know from Nehemiah what was wrong. And so quickly Nehemiah tells the king of all that was going on in his hometown, of all that was happening in Jerusalem, and he prefaces it with his own question. Why should my face not be sad when the city of my fathers lies buried desolate and in ruins, according to verse 3. Now, this tells us something about the man Nehemiah. 
Nehemiah was a man we might call a, a, a man of sorrows. He was affected by the things that went on around him. He was affected both negatively and positively. Emotions are not a bad thing. And I know uh, men of, and little boys have often been told, it, you know, it, men don't cry and men don't do this and men don't do that. Well, I'm here to tell you, Nehemiah was a man. If you don't believe that, you read the rest of the book. This guy knew how to get things done, and he had to stand up to some very difficult people. Nehemiah was a man, but Nehemiah didn't mind weeping. He didn't mind uh, showing his emotions when it was appropriate, and he did so. And, uh, but what that indicates to us is that he had a very tender heart for the things that were important, and especially things that affected the people of God. His concern was for his people and the land of his people, and it superseded any concern that he had for himself. This day he was overwhelmed. This day he was overtaken. And it didn't matter, really, if the king had banished him from the throne room, if he had sentenced him to death, Nehemiah was still going to feel the same way that he felt about what was taking place in Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, we're told that on one occasion Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion for them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You remember in John chapter 4 when uh, the disciples went into the city of Sychar in order to get food? Jesus begins a conversation with that woman at the well. And as the disciples come back from the city and they said, here we have food, Jesus says, I have food you know nothing of. Now the disciples suspected somebody came along behind their back and fed him. But Jesus makes it a little more clear when he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Have you ever been so overcome by an emotion or by a purpose, by something you had, a task that you had at hand, something you had to do that you just forgot to eat, that you forgot you were hungry? That ever happened to you? Well, it happened to Jesus, and uh, on this occasion, though it didn't have to do with his food, it had to do with his countenance, it happened to Nehemiah. So the question still remains, why was his face so sad? Well, I think there are a number of reasons why Nehemiah was so distraught over the condition of his city. One, Nehemiah was a man with a burden. He had a burden for the people of God. You know, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 9, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes fountains of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Here was a man who looked at the condition of the people, and all he wanted to do was cry. All he wanted to do was weep. Nehemiah understood that. Although his was many years later, and although it was for a different reason, but he saw that though the city was destroyed, nobody had gone in to rebuild, nobody had gone in to restore, and the people there were in danger, and they were ashamed. And he, like Jeremiah, was ready to weep. On one occasion, Jesus stood over uh, Jerusalem, looking down from the Mount of Olives, and he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered you, uh, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus lamented the condition of the city, and that's what Nehemiah was doing here. Nehemiah had a burden for the state of the city of God. The people were in exile, and they were in exile for a reason. They were in exile because they had forsaken their God, and they had gone into idolatry and into sin. There are too many passages, really, to count. As you read through the latter half of the Old Testament, whether we're looking at the Chronicles or we're looking at uh, the Kings or we look into the prophetic books, beginning with Isaiah and on, we begin to see the condition of the people as they got further and further away from God. Nehemiah alerts us to that in the midst of the prayer that he utters in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 7. He says, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. They just had not obeyed the will of God. In Daniel chapter 9, another uh, victim or another character of the exile 
Daniel says, We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. It wasn't just that they forgot about God. It wasn't just that they had violated a command or two. But Daniel makes it very clear they had actually rebelled against God. They had turned their back on him. They had gone the complete opposite direction of what God desired for them or intended for them. And they had abandoned the one who had delivered them so many times. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, Isaiah cried out. You remember that great scene as, as he beheld the Lord and the seraphim flying about. And one of them comes and touches a coal to his mouth. And in the midst of all of that, Isaiah realized, woe is me. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Some people have argued whether uh, Isaiah is using this metaphorically to talk about all of the sins of the people, or he's just admitting he had a potty mouth and so did everybody that was around him. You could take it either way, to be honest, but either way, it shows a disregard for God. And Isaiah recognized he had done that in his own life. And he lived in the midst of a people who had done the very same thing. Actually, I believe the phrase may uh, point to the fact that uh, from their mouth and in their behavior, they had given no glory to God. They had dishonored him in every way possible. Isaiah admitted his own fault, and he lived among a people who were guilty of the very same thing. You remember that little book of Habakkuk, that uh, quaint little book right in the middle of the prophet's and Habakkuk starts out the book by complaining to God, complaining because the people were so wicked and so sinful. In Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, he says, Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. That's the people he was dealing with. And Habakkuk wanted to know, God, why in the world won't you do something about this? And he's not talking about the pagan nations around him. He's talking about his own people. He's talking about the people of God. And this is what they had done with what God had given them to do. And you remember the rest of the story. God says, well, don't worry about it, Habakkuk. I'm sending the Chaldeans to destroy them and to take them captive. The Chaldeans, they're worse than we are. And then there becomes that debate between Habakkuk and God over exactly the right thing to do. And God says, look, Habakkuk, just settle down. The just will live by faith, and you need to trust me. And so Habakkuk is an interesting read for us to understand uh, the, the difficulty sometimes and the wickedness we live amongst and what God will do about it. But the lesson I want you to see here is that God's people were where they were. The Chaldeans were sent to destroy them and to carry them away because they had been caught up in sin. Nehemiah also had a burden to do something about it. He realized the condition of the city. He realized the reason for the condition of the city, but he said, I want to do something. And so what did he do? Well, he began to visualize. When the story was first told to him about the city, he pictured in his mind what that must have been like. Now realize, he didn't have a newspaper, he didn't have the internet, and he didn't have uh, the, the national news to, to uh, turn on the TV and, and uh, see the video. You know, today we see things that happen all the way across the world. And we can see them almost in an instant, especially on the internet. If somebody goes live on Facebook or uh, any other form of social media, immediately the whole world knows what is happening. It doesn't take very long at all. And Nehemiah didn't have any of these things. But in his mind, he could see it. He envisioned the beauty and the glory of the city as he remembered it. But now it was lying there in ruins. Now it was in total despair. Now the book of Nehemiah is a book about rebuilding torn down walls. And when Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem, ultimately, that's the first thing that he concerns himself with. He wants to build the walls. Walls, you see, are, are for protection. Walls are for separation. Walls are for conservation. But although we're dealing with literal walls, and he was going to build literal walls, they were also symbolic. Because they symbolize the glory of God. They symbolize the salvation of God. They symbolize the protection that God would give to his people. 
And Nehemiah knew with the walls fallen, the city would never be what it could or what it ought to be. Nehemiah agonized over this. We notice this already as he mourned for four months. And he prayed about this for four solid months. Prayer is always a good exercise, especially when we don't know what else to do. But prayer is a poor substitute for action. We can pray and we ought to pray. But we need to know that there is a time to act and there is a time to do. Somebody said you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. But once you've prayed, uh, you must do more than pray after you've prayed. And it will take all of our effort to get the job done. We may not be equal in gifts, but we can be equal in sacrifice and we can be equal in commitment. And so, Nehemiah agonized. Some of you may remember the comedian Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson was asked on one occasion about his religion. He said, well, I, uh, he said he told them that he was a Jehovah's bystander. They said, a Jehovah's bystander? What in the world is that? He said, well, they wanted me to be a Jehovah's witness, uh, but I didn't want to get involved. So he decided he'd be a bystander. Well, you know, a lot of people live their lives that way. They'd a whole lot rather be a bystander than to get involved. Nehemiah ultimately organized. And that's what chapter 2 goes on to unfold. As the king recognized what was going on, he saw the sadness of his face. He asked him what was wrong, and he began to explain. Finally, the king said, well, Nehemiah, what can I do? Isn't that something? The most powerful man in the world is looking at his cupbearer, who was sad about the condition of his hometown. And he said, Nehemiah, what can I do? Now that probably tells us a little bit more about Nehemiah, and this isn't entirely a lesson about Nehemiah, so I can't go fully into that. But what a relationship these two men must have had. Though one was a lowly cupbearer, a slave for all intents and purposes, and the other was the king. The king loved Nehemiah, the king trusted Nehemiah, and the king was concerned for Nehemiah. Now that didn't happen overnight, and that didn't happen easily. But Nehemiah had built a relationship with the man that he says, what can I do? And so Nehemiah asked for three things. He asked for the king's permission. Can I go and help my city? Verse 4. He asked for the king's protection. Now, there are going to be some people who are going to try to stop things. Can you help me out there? And the king obliged. And then he asked for the king's provision. You know, it's going to take a lot to rebuild those walls. Is there anything you can do to help out with that? And so the king gave him his Lowe's card and said, go buy whatever you need. Well, not exactly, but you get the point. He provided whatever he needed. And he said, you go do what you need to do. It's also interesting that the text tells us that a time limit was put on. Nehemiah didn't want to be gone too long, and the king didn't want him gone too long. And so Nehemiah said, when my job's done, I'll come back. And that was the agreement. And so Nehemiah set his face to do the work. That's why Nehemiah's face was sad, because he was burdened. He was burdened by what was happening in the city. So let me ask this question. Why should your face be sad? You see, there's something more here than just a, a quaint little story about a cupbearer and a king. There's some, there are lessons here for us to learn. There are three basic lessons we ought to ask ourselves about every passage of Scripture uh, that we study. Is that, are there two bells or just one? There'll be a second one? All right. There are three basic questions we ought to ask ourselves about every passage of Scripture we study. What did it mean then? What does it mean now? And what does it mean to me? If we can get a hold of that, we'll learn a whole lot more about our Bible than we sometimes do, just floundering around trying to figure it out. You see, Jerusalem throughout Scripture, and particularly in the prophetic passages, was, uh, it came to represent the new kingdom. And, and what was going to happen when the Messiah came. In Isaiah chapter 2, we're told that the law would go forth from Jerusalem. When Jesus instructed his disciples uh, after his resurrection, he told them that, they should, uh, that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his uh, name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jerusalem was going to be important. It was significant to everything that was going to go on in the plan of God. We even sometimes say, let's go back to Jerusalem, indicating that's when the church was pure, that's when it was right, that's what we need to model. And so we understand the importance of Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem, unfortunately, however, often finds itself in a state of ruin. And that is all because of sin. As we said, the walls of Nehemiah were literal, but they were symbolic as well. And there are some walls that sometimes are destroyed that need to be lifted back up. We need to lift back up the walls of decency. We've ceased as a society to be shocked about almost anything. You turn on the television and there are things going on on on, uh, everyday television that we wouldn't have thought about 10, 15, 20, or 25 years ago. And yet, we think nothing about it at all. We're much like the people that Jeremiah describes in Jeremiah chapter 6, that they were uh, not ashamed at all, nor did they blush. They are walls of doctrine. Extremism can be a difficult thing. We don't want to go to poles either one way or the other. But we want to find uh, the, the right middle, where God wants us to be. We don't want to be so liberal that we give up everything. We don't want to be so conservative that we draw a circle around ourselves and we're suspicious about everybody else. I don't think that's what God intended. But we need to be faithful to what God teaches us. Paul told his young friend Titus, but as for you, speak the things that are fitting of sound doctrine, healthy teaching. And that's what we need to be concerned about. And we also need to have walls of dedication. Loyalty to the church is a lost character trait. You know, I was uh, listening to a podcast not long ago. You know the way that uh, many churches, and, and I'm using that term loosely, denominational churches, you know the way they measure attendance anymore? If you attend at least one time a month, you're faithful. And I'm afraid that seeps over into us. Now the good news is that studies show that churches of Christ are, among, are at the very top of religious bodies that have people returning on a regular basis to our assembly. But we're stop, still not real good at that, are we? From Sunday morning, your crowd will be cut to about 60%, and on Wednesday night, you might be able to match it, but maybe not. We need to build up the walls of commitment. Well, that's the second bell, so I'll pause there, and we'll close out the lesson here in just a moment. Thank you.